Hello and welcome to Murder in the UK. Today we're looking at the case of Shahadil Ahmed. In December 2002, Rachel Manning left a nightclub in Milton Keynes to catch a taxi home. She had never arrived home. On the 11th of December, Rachel was found dead in undergrowth at Woburn Golf Course in Bedfordshire. Rachel's boyfriend, Barry White, aged 34, was tried and sent to prison for her murder. It wasn't until 2008 that Barry was acquitted when new forensic evidence was found. Ahmed was tried at Luton Crown Court and found guilty. He was sentenced to a minimum term of 17 years in prison. What's your thoughts on this case? Let's have a discussion in the comments below. If you want further information, visit www.murderuk.com or stay tuned right here for a video, video documentary about this case. Thank you. Tuesday the 11th of December 2000, Milton Keynes, Buckinghamshire, England. A greenkeeper is shocked to discover the body of a young woman in the undergrowth on a golf course. Why would you do something like that? Why would you hurt someone, that, especially someone that, that nice and that caring? Her future was taken away in the most horrible circumstances that you could get. The victim, 19-year-old Rachel Manning, has been murdered, beaten repeatedly and almost unrecognisably with a steering lock. Whoever had done it had tried to mask her identity by causing her injuries that would disfigure her. In the subsequent case, police follow a specific line of inquiry, linking their main suspects to the crime, eventually convicting them. Prior to that, I'd never had a parking ticket, and at that point, my whole world went bang. But the conviction is overturned, revealing the inadequacy of the previous forensic evidence. There's no excuse for making mistakes. And that's what happened. A mistake was made. But a new forensic discovery turns the case completely on its head, proving that when crime happens, it always leaves a trace. This case is that perfect example of everybody thought the original convictions were absolutely safe and sound and nothing had gone wrong. It was clear to me that there was no way that these two men could have committed this crime. And what that meant was that there was a murderer on the list. When teenager Rachel Manning's body was found two days after she disappeared, it had been partially hidden in the undergrowth. Within minutes, police would arrive on the scene. What would become a complex 12-year investigation was about to begin. In 1998, Rachel had met sports shop assistant Barry White. I was working at JJB Sports. I had a good job, I had a good life, it was a good life. I met Rachel through friends. I, uh, and then one night we got invited to a party because um, my friends were getting their uh, A-level results. So we went to a party around one of their houses and Rachel ended up come, turning up. And I ended up looking at her and thinking, wow, she's beautiful, and going to chat with her, ended up getting together with me and her. Rachel was a feisty, practical sort of person. She wouldn't take any nonsense. I mean, you know, she'd put Barry in, in his place. And if they, if at any time, no, they did have a row or anything like that, the first thing Barry used to do was walk off. She was a brilliant person, absolutely lovely, like bubbly, great personality, great laugh to be around. Always laughing and soul at a party, never wanted to hurt anybody, just, she was just a general lovely person. But it wasn't all plain sailing for the young couple. And they'd actually lived together, but both of them suffered from money problems. At the time of the alleged murder, Rachel had gone to live with two male friends in a flat in Wolverton. Barry had gone back home to live with his mother in Bletchley. On the evening of Saturday, December the 9th, 2000, Barry and Rachel went with some of their friends to a 70s themed party. It was my mum's 40th birthday and she arranged a fancy dress party. She'd arranged it for a long time. Right? And everyone was looking forward to the party. Me, my sister, my mum, my stepdad, Roy, we were all looking forward to the party. Right? There was loads of people coming. 
Rachel and Barry were captured on some amateur video footage taken that night. Rachel was wearing this really distinctive blue wig. Barry was in these massively wide, white flared trousers. And it was a party for the night. So they both went along, atmosphere was great, everyone had a good time. Really good night, dancing away, drinking away, so having a great night. And then we decided to move on to another place called Chicago's up the city centre. As they left the nightclub later on after a few more drinks, around 1.30, 2am, Barry gets into an argument. He goes over to a kebab stall, um, an unpleasant group. Uh, a man who I think is a warehouseman for a local supermarket is known to have a reputation, apparently. And he decided to pick on Barry, suggested that Barry had spilt some salad down his shirt. Jalapeno peppers. I don't like them. So I was walking, looking at a kebab and just throwing them off. One of them hit a guy and... He took offence to it and it ended up kicking off with him and all his friends. And they really came at Barry and they had a real go at him and one of them threw a punch at Barry, hit him on the side of the face and, and you know, remonstrated with him for the fact that some of his, his salad from his kebab had, had flicked at them. Rachel stepped in and tried splitting it all up, which she managed to do. When the police turned up, I was like, I'm not getting arrested, so I walked away. Rachel followed me. We walked around for a bit. We ended up stopping and having a little chat behind this Indian restaurant. So I was trying to get him to go back to the club and to carry on queuing for a taxi, and Barry didn't want to have anything to do with that. I said, like, look, no, I'm not going back to the club. If I go back, there might be more trouble. So all I wanted to do was go to Keith's house, get a lift home, because I had work in the morning. So I just wanted to get home as quick as I could. Deciding to stay with his friend Keith Hyatt was a fateful decision, one with dramatic consequences for Barry and tragically for Rachel. Barry makes his way towards Keith's home, gets there. When he arrives early hours of the morning, Keith has been up for part of the night, has fallen asleep on the settee. I was woke up by, um, you know, the doorbell ringing and then banging on the door. And uh, that was when Barry came in. Keith decided to keep a fairly open house for various friends, a bit of a good Samaritan. Uh, pulled Barry's leg about the fancy dress he was wearing, went to make Barry a cup of tea. While he was making the tea, the phone rang, so Keith answered it. Keith picked it up, answered it. This Barry is Rachel, yeah. So we chatted on the phone. Now I could hear Barry getting, losing his temper a bit because she didn't know where she was. Arranged to meet up because uh, she told me she was lost on Old Brook. So I was like, go to Blockbusters and I'll meet you there. I'll get Keith to give me a lift down in the van and I'll meet you there. We got down to Blockbusters. She never turned up. Barry and Keith continue to drive around in Keith's van, looking for Rachel. They go back at least twice, if not three times, and she's still not there. Barry leaves Keith's home and walks around the block. There are pictures from CCTV footage showing Barry walking around the various roads looking for her. And there's places you can't get to in cars. So I thought I'd go and have a little look for her on the roadway, see if I could see her. Couldn't spot her anywhere. By now, the effects of the night and the inconclusive search had worn Barry out. And then I said to Keith, I was like, look, mate, I'm going to have to go home. It's early. I was like, I've got work in the morning. So I got to keep giving me a lift home. I think I arrived home at about 5 o'clock in the morning. And when he got back, there was some family member who was asleep on the sofa. And so they woke up when Barry got in. They said that Barry was absolutely fine, was worried about Rachel, but was otherwise perfectly OK, normal, still had the white trousers on. And then he went to bed. I went to work. Finished work, got home. I'd asked my mum if anyone had heard from Rachel. Nothing. People coming around saying, have you seen Rachel? I said, no, I haven't. And um, you, know, you don't think of anything like this. Then I started getting a little bit more worried. I went to her work, asked if, asked, like, if I could speak to her, and they're like, she hasn't turned up. That's when I was like, look, something's, something's wrong. I don't know if something's wrong. I'm worried now. So we went back to her house, set up her flatmates, phoned her mum, her mum came home, and that's when we reported her to the police, reported her missing. Within hours, a major search would be underway. But for everyone connected with Rachel Manning, 
the nightmare was only beginning. 19-year-old Rachel Manning left a nightclub in Milton Keynes, Buckinghamshire in the early hours of Sunday the 10th of December 2000. After an altercation involving her boyfriend Barry White outside the club, the two separated. She was never seen alive again. When I reported her missing, the police took their statement down for me, come back and pick me up and took me to the spot where I last see her, where I last like, spoke to her, and then took them to Key's house where I went. And yeah, the next, the, the next morning, this was a Tuesday, that's when her body was found. The greenkeeper of the Woburn Golf Course had been out and about on his daily, daily rounds. Um, that day, some new cabling was being laid and he was patrolling the grounds as he often would and, and he saw something. He saw what looked like a, a, a white boot and he approached and as he got closer he, he saw it with the outline of a body and he thought perhaps it was a, a, a mannequin, a tailor's dummy and as he got closer he realised that it was a body of a woman and he immediately realised that it was the dead body of a woman and he called the police. Keith Hyatt, meanwhile, immediately found himself at the centre of the police inquiry. And on that particular morning, Keith had to drive near to the Woburn golf course, saw a lot of police attention, police vehicles, phoned Sharon, Barry's mother, to say, look, there's a lot of police attention near the Woburn golf course. It might be something to do with Rachel. Would you like me to stop and have a word with them? And so he went to the police officer that was on the cordon and said, what's happening? you know, what's going on. And he told the police officer that his uh, friend's girlfriend had gone missing a couple of days before, that people were worried about her and asked if, you know, if, if a body had been found. I just got the impression from the young police officer that it probably was Rachel. And then he goes, if you hold on, I'll go up to the top and find one of the uh, DCs. And the next thing is I was hauled down to Bletchley Police Station. It was him doing that which then put them into the spotlight for the police because they thought that was a kind of classic behaviour of a killer or somebody involved with a murder coming back to a scene to see what's going on. I get two CID locked down, like, you keep hype. We're arresting you for the, uh, the murder of um, Rachel. Prior to that, I'd never had a parking ticket. And at that point, my whole world went bang, just went imploded. Whoever killed Rachel had attacked her savagely with some sort of a weapon. She was struck about 17 times. Most of her teeth were broken. Her jaw was broken. It was a frenzied and brutal attack. She'd received a number of nasty injuries to her face, around the eye socket, the cheek, the head. The suggestion being whoever had done it had tried to mask her identity by causing her injuries that would disfigure her. There was an expert at the time of the trial that suggested that that might be the sort of thing a boyfriend would do. It might, would have to be somebody that knew Rachel, that would feel anger towards her, that would feel the need to do something after she was dead. And so that was one of those things, again, that just put a spotlight onto, onto Barry. Police then moved to arrest Barry White. The police come and arrested me. Like that morning, took me to the police station, interviewed me. I think they were adamant that I was the guilty person. Well, that's how it felt when I was being interviewed. It felt like they were going after me. They kept saying that, like that, it was just me that killed Rachel and just admitting now and things like that. All this time, I'm really thinking, at some point, someone's going to come in and say, oh, sorry, sorry about this, but, but, uh, we know it's not you. And that didn't happen. Released on bail, Barry and Keith's lives became the subject of an intensive police operation over the next two months. Both were subjected to interviews. There were, in total, three separate days of interviews. The first set were in December, there was another set in January, and then a set finally in February. It was three sets of interviews per day before they were released the first two occasions. Then, on the last occasion, they were charged. The two of them were really thrown into this absolutely at the deep end when they are suddenly on that on the receiving end of being the person that's on the other side of the interview desk from two police officers who 
are very professional, know what they're doing, and are going to interview somebody very closely, quite rightly so. But I imagine that that is a hugely intimidating thing to go through, and they were both totally out of their depth. I never thought I'd get charged with it, never in a million years thought I'd get charged with it, because I, I, I never done nothing wrong. The trial of Barry White and Keith Hyatt began in July 2001. The prosecution case centred on the assertion that Barry killed Rachel and Keith helped him dispose of her body. The trial lasted five weeks. It was just a farce just listening to this rubbish coming out of people's mouths. The initial premise was that they had a specific motive for committing the crime. The suggestion from the prosecution was that Barry and Keith were in a homosexual relationship and that is why they decided they needed to, and the phrase used was, get rid of Rachel, who was uh, an obstacle in the way of that relationship. Didn't even know who Barry was. Didn't know who I was. Had no idea. Now that was based almost entirely on an entry in Keith's diary of having seen Barry without his top on at one of the parties they went to, and he simply said, Barry has a nice body. And they trawled through Keith's di diaries um, to an incredible degree, and that's probably the best phrase they came up with. But that, that was the basis of the case. That, that's why he wanted to get rid of his girlfriend. A trial is like a game of chess. If you have the best player who makes all the right moves, you win. If you don't, you go to jail. They try to say that I got angry with her, like, I caught up with her, got me and her around a blazing argument. I got angry with her and strangled her. Then I phoned Keith to help me move the body. And then supposedly when we moved the body, they said that I caved their face in with a steering lock, which was quite hard to hear. To most experts, the prosecuting hypothesis seemed ludicrous. Can you imagine the scenario of Barry ringing Keith up and saying, hey, come on out me, mate. I've just murdered uh, Rachel. Uh, we need to dump the body. And you can imagine him late at night, Keith saying, yeah, OK, I'll be over. We'll sort that out for you. It just seemed ridiculous. Keith would have run a mile. There's no, no way, shape or form he would have gone out in his van in the middle of the night to take the body of a girl he knew reasonably well as well as he knew Barry and dump her somewhere. That, that was just totally and utterly implausible. There was such a tiny window of opportunity for Keith and Barry to have committed this crime. It was mission impossible. On the day that Keith had visited the location where Rachel's body had been found, police had impounded his van. The police had moved my van from where I had parked, and they moved it right to the very top where the forensic tent was, so where Rachel was. The police allowed Keith's van, which was at that point put onto a recovery vehicle and taken away from the area by, by police, was photographed by that local newspaper. And so that photograph of Keith's van at the site where a body had been taken was then put out in the local press. And I think a lot of that sort of thing was, was sort of subliminally planted into people's minds because they put two and two together. They saw that the police had seized a van, they saw that it was at a murder site, they see that people at the, the police are asking for information about that and they start thinking, hang on, you know, I, this obviously is the van that's involved with it. Maybe I saw the van that night and that is irresponsible, I think, and, and shouldn't have been allowed to happen. The primary evidence centered around particles of lighter flint alleged to have been found on Rachel's clothes and other forensic evidence presented by Professor Kenneth Pye, a forensic geologist working for the prosecution. Without Professor Pye, the case against Barry and Keith would never have gone to court. It was the pivotal piece of, of evidence. They said that there were these minuscule particles that you wouldn't be able to see with the naked eye that were on her skirt, on the victim's skirt, and that were also on the van seat from Keith's van. And the expert said that finding those particles in both those locations, on the victim's skirt and in Keith's van, meant that she had to be in that van very soon before her body was left at the wood. And it was that bit of evidence that got the case to court. We know that Rachel smoked. We know that Barry smoked. We know that they were at a club 
where there was a lot of smoking going on. We know that beforehand they were at a birthday party and the videos show they were sitting on the floor doing boat races with drinks and, and dancing around and everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people were smoking. Light of flint's everywhere. I mean, it's, it's everywhere, light of flint. Everyone, you could smoke in nightclubs back then. So there was light of flint everywhere. But they used, the, they used the word rare earth elements. Before the party, she tried the skirt on. It was a fancy dress party, so she tried it on and then dumped it and left it on the floor. She'd bought it the day before at a second-hand store. <laughs> so goodness knows what, what state the skirt was in. I'm not surprising it had 20-odd particles on it, to tell you the truth. I'm surprised it didn't have thousands of particles. An awful lot of resources by the police have been put in to establishing a forensic link between Barry and Keith, their clothing, their, their footwear, Keith's van and the victim. And nothing could be found. There was absolutely nothing that could put them at that crime scene or even in any way, in any, any incriminating way, on, on Rachel or anything associated with the murder. Keith smoked very, very heavily. He didn't clean the van out much. And they found a lot of particles in the van. Prosecution put one and one together and came up with three. The problem was there was no evidence that these particles were collected only from that site. No one knew anything about the particles. There was ten forensic experts and only one found the link, and that was the light of flint. That was Professor Pye who found the light of flint and basically said that she must have been in that van moments before she was killed because the light of flint don't stay on her clothing for that long. It falls off within a certain amount of time, which later on we found out was not true. It can stay on there up to like longer than 16 hours. With both sides of the story heard in court, it was left to the jury to decide. The judge said, well, we really need, we really need a, um, an answer by Friday because um, I'm away on holiday, which I didn't think was correct thing to say. Um, so that's what happened. So the evidence did come out on Friday. Barry White received a life sentence for the murder of Rachel Manning. Keith Hyatt was convicted of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. I was just pure shocked. It was just, how could they find me guilty for saying I ain't done? I was in pieces. So is Barry, the parents. I felt helpless, you know what I mean? Like, there's nothing I could do. Even though I was innocent, no matter how much I shouted, I was innocent. No one, no, it felt like no one believed me, apart from my family and some, some friends. My father, to the day that he died, he would cry when they, you know, in the news, when you have the meat wagon, he'd break into tears on that. Because it sort of just remind him of, when he saw it all go out. When the judge went, I sent it to life, take him down. We went downstairs and I was putting the cells downstairs. Barry White and Keith were now in prison. Long terms ahead of them, their reputations in tatters, their futures destroyed. I sat there thinking, I've just been found, I've just been given a life sentence for something I haven't done. I was like, this is wrong, this is really wrong. From the moment of their arrest, both had protested their innocence. Now the science of forensics and the dogged determination of many was about to prove them right. When the strangled and beaten body of 19-year-old shop assistant Rachel Manning was found on a Buckinghamshire golf course in December 2000, suspicion and then evidence pointed to the guilt of her boyfriend, Barry White, and his friend and presumed accomplice, Keith Hyatt. In 2002, both were jailed for their part in the murder. It was a ruthless time in my life. It was proper horrible. Terrified, absolutely terrified. I didn't leave myself in. Really. When you get to jail and you say you're innocent, they say, well, everyone's innocent in jail, everybody. 400 cells, 400 inmates all doing life. It was a scary place, scary. I started off on the hospital wing because they thought I was suicidal and I was in there for a few months 
and then they shipped me out to a place called Bullingdon, which was a horrible prison, horrible. But I had to have a few fights in there because how they looked at it, I was accused of killing a teenage girl. Even though I told them I was innocent, no one believed me, not nobody. Both vehemently protested their innocence and set about doing something about it. The inmates, they have, um, in the evening, there was, uh, you get a Mars bar, whoever got it right, depending on how many letters did Keith write last night. I went to the Queen, Prince Philip, Prince Charles, all the way down, the fact they're all family, prime ministers, you know, leaders, cabinet ministers. The matter of Rachel Manning's murder eventually came to the attention of a BBC television investigative program, Rough Justice. This particular letter, I remember, really spoke out. I mean, it just seemed incredibly genuine and really, really trying to get help. I then made a, um, an appointment to go and see some of Baron Keith's family, and I thought I'd turn up and there'd be a couple of people there out in Milton Keynes, and we'd just sort of chat about, about their conviction and see whether the rough justice, whether we could help. But when I got there, there was a living room absolutely packed full of people. The two men had only just been convicted. Everyone was reeling still from the conviction and really never thought for a second that they would actually get convicted. So when those guilty verdicts came in, they were completely reeling. Despite having met with the families, the rough justice team was slow to be fully convinced of the claims of innocence. And there were things, for instance, you know, we found that Keith had washed his van the day after that the police thought that, that Rachel's body had been dumped, which appears suspicious. You know, that seems strange. What's he doing out there? There's a witness saying that they saw him cleaning his van, you know, very thoroughly the day after he's apparently dumped this, this body. And so things like that would come up every now and again, and you think, oh, OK, I'm, you know, really? So I'm not sure. So it was, it was by no means a, an absolute certainty right from the start that the two men were innocent. Like the families, Louise Shorter focused on the key pieces of forensic evidence which had convicted the two men. I contacted so many experts about this. You know, I, I just got in touch with, with anybody I could possibly identify that might be an expert in this kind of field, and eventually came to Dr. Bull, and this really was his area of expertise. I told Louise Shorter at the very beginning that I would take it on pro bono and do it, but she needed to warn both Barry and Keith, who were in prison, that to be very, very careful. If they were guilty, and I could prove it, I would say so. The two of them were really consistent. They never wavered from what happened that night. They always said the same thing. They always answered all questions. They always gave every sample they were asked for. They subjected themselves to every test that was ever requested of them. They did everything they possibly could to clear their names. Barry and Keith firstly submitted themselves to mitochondrial DNA testing. I was in Swaleside on the Isle of Sheppey, and they come up with a camera crew and took my DNA. When they come back and they said that the DNA don't match mine, even though I knew it wasn't going to match mine because I knew I had nothing to do with it, that was that was good to hear when they come back. That Peter Bull also re-examined the particles found on Rachel's skirt. There were only 20 odd particles, I think, in the end that were found on on the skirt, and it was quite important, I think, for the prosecution that you didn't get vast amounts of these particles. They they only had small amounts that would would, would ever come off every time you flicked a lighter. So I tested that assertion, and they were wrong. But just how wrong had the analysis been? I found under controlled experiments that you could get thousands of particles for every flick of a lighter. They could travel two meters. I even had my students sitting in a group of six or eight of them with only two people who smoked and they tested everyone else at the end of the evening to see if they had the particles on them and they did. There were clearly significant question marks over the whole forensic process, and just as concerning was what hadn't been found. 
One of the big concerns that Keith Hart always had was that he'd had an Alsatian dog in the van with him fairly regularly, and none of the samples taken of the seats, which formed the basis for Professor Pye's evidence that she must have sat there being propped between the two, none of those samples contained any dog hair. And so Keith's view always was, well, they, perhaps these samples weren't taken from my vehicle, or if they were, it's amazing there was no dog hair found. At face value, it appeared that the evidence which had convicted Barry and Keith was tenuous at best. As a journalist, it was clear to me that there was no way that these two men could have committed this crime. And what that meant was that there was a murderer on the list. We had three reports from three forensic scientists, all of them effectively saying that the evidence from Professor Pike was unreliable, that what he claimed to be particles from a cigarette lighter um, had not been properly tested in the sense, yes, they did come from a cigarette lighter, but their actual mixture was not unusual at all. The thrust of the defence argument was, whereas the prosecution through Pi wanted to make these particles on that front seat of that van special, which would meant that she could only have sat on that particular seat at that time. In actual fact, those particles could be on any surface near to which a cigarette smoker had been. Just as importantly, CCTV didn't back up any of the prosecution's story, particularly that Keith and Barry had never been to a car park in the town they said they'd driven to that night. There was an officer required to play the CCTV footage, what was available, and they asked the, the defense asked the question when the jury were out, well, is there footage of the, the car park? And they said, well, no, there isn't any footage. And the officer played some film and allowed it to run too far, at which stage they came across the footage in question. And when what that was looked at, it was fairly plain that they'd been there at least twice, if not three occasions. And actually, we found that there was a huge amount of CCTV that night that showed where Barry and Keith were throughout the evening. So when we really drilled down into how much opportunity did they have, we realized that actually it was tiny. It was absolutely minuscule for them to have pulled this off. They had to, in that time, have driven a couple of miles to the golf course, deposited the body up a muddy slope at night with no lights. There were no lights on anywhere. They had to dump the body, get back in the van, and drive back down to be seen on CCTV cameras again. One part of the evidence was there was no mud from the scene actually uh, in the van. There's something wrong there. Um, that, that, that just doesn't make sense. Every time we found something like CCTV footage or a new witness, they, that just confirmed that they were doing what they said. So when Barry said, I went out on foot and I searched for her, we found footage of Barry with the black coat on and the, still the white flares and the black hat searching for Rachel exactly like he said. In this situation, the absence of evidence was evidence of absence. Quite, it was quite a good feeling. Like after the program finished, everybody the next day, inmates, officers, all come up to me like, "You're innocent." They were was like, "You're going home. You're going home." So I thought, "Yes, I'm going home soon." I didn't know it'd take another three years to get me to go home. Every time we managed to get a piece of evidence that could either destroy or confirm their story, every single time it backed up what they told us. And when it came to the steering lock which had been instrumental in Rachel's death. Whatever evidence had been relied on in the original trial was now discredited. The science of DNA was, was rapidly developing then as it still is. And in the space of time between the trial and the instruction, the new expert said effectively, and after some time, whoever else's DNA there is on that stop lock, it is not Barry's or Keith's, which was a, a major step forward. One thing I found that was quite surprising was the materials that Rachel was wearing, a sort of a, an acrylic nylon type material, which is very smooth, doesn't have much of a weave, attracts a lot of particles. And, these, and they stayed in my experiments for a long time. And the reason was because of electrostatic forces kept them there. Some of the particles will drop off initially very fast. 
But those that get caught up in the waves stay for a long, long time. And they will stay for weeks and weeks and weeks. Peter Bull and the team now believed the fibers were inconclusive. The forensics were inconclusive. The CCTV was telling and the DNA was beyond question. We had to do a whole range of different papers to try and get to a position where we could then put an appeal document in and say, you got it wrong. As far as I'm concerned, you haven't got it right. In 2005, Keith Hyatt was released on parole with his conviction still standing. Coming out of prison is quite a frightening thing because you've, you've led this life where you've got a big wall around you, so you feel protected. I felt safe in prison, and I didn't feel safe coming out. If I was in a small you know, pub or something like that, I'd always make sure I knew where the, I could escape. Uh, and you were always looking over your shoulder. In 2007, Barry White appealed against his conviction. When they said conviction cross, it felt so, it felt a good relief, really felt like a big weight had been lifted off my shoulders and I was so happy. And then the prosecution turned around and went, we want a retrial. And I was, I was like, what? You, I've just been found, uh, like my conviction just crossed. You've seen that it's been proved that I'm innocent. Why do you want a retrial? But they were granted the retrial and I, and I was like, right. This is going to be another year to get me back into court for a retrial. And I, I didn't think I was going home. I thought, as soon as they said retrial, I was like, right, I ain't going home. I'm not going to get bail. I'm going to go back to jail for another year until the retrial comes up and I get found not guilty. But the judge turned around and was like, my sister was like, we'd like to apply for bail. Um, they've got £55,000 in insurance to go up. And the judge went, right, we grant you bail. And I was like, I thought, I'm actually going home. I'm going home now. And like, I, was like, I was so excited. I was like, get in now, I'm actually going home. At the subsequent retrial, Barry was acquitted. Both Barry White and Keith Hyatt were now free. The review of evidence and the forensic examinations hadn't just shown they hadn't done what the prosecution had originally claimed. It had turned up some new forensics. Forensics which were about to crack the case wide open. In 2007, Barry White was acquitted at a retrial of the murder of Rachel Manning in 2000. His alleged accomplice, Keith Hyatt, had already served a sentence in connection with the crime. White, 29 at the time of his release, had been Rachel's boyfriend, and he and Hyatt had always protested their innocence. Barry and Keith's release had been affected on the back of dogged detective work by the BBC TV crime programme, Rough Justice and the court's acceptance of incorrect forensic evidence. But the mystery of what had happened to Rachel on the night of the 9th of December 2000 still remained unsolved. But forensic science was about to take the investigation in an entirely new direction. CCTV fiber analysis and DNA profiling had proven who hadn't killed Rachel. The case was now more open than ever and the key piece of forensic evidence was on what was believed to be the murder weapon. So we have the crook lock as our murder weapon. Obviously, we would expect to find DNA from the victim on the end that was used to strike the victim, and we did. On the other end, we looked for and found DNA at the end where we would anticipate somebody was holding it in order to use it as a weapon. So touch DNA is quite tricky and the scientists involved in that would have gone through a whole process of what's the best way to lift any potential touch DNA from the actual end where it would have been held and then what's the best way to profile it. But they came up with a profile that was loadable to the DNA database. So loading something onto the DNA database as a crime scene sample, you would do with the expectation that it will hit against a suspect sample that's already been loaded there and it didn't. So it was loaded as a crime scene sample, but it didn't match anybody, any of the samples already on the DNA database at that point. But the murder weapon would soon find a match. In May 2010, a woman on a night out approached a car believing it to be a taxi. 
The driver was, in fact, an opportunistic sexual predator. And unknown to the woman, she was in mortal danger. She gets into the car, and at some point, very shortly after that, he tries to attack her, he tries to grope her. She manages to free herself, she gets out of the car, and tries to run away. Now, this is all witnessed by a passerby, a good Samaritan who can see that this young woman is in trouble. She escaped after being indecently assaulted and was helped by a passing lorry driver. He walks this 19-year-old woman back to her house, makes sure that she's safe. Now, as he goes about his way, he sees the car again. Now, the car is doing parallels and he thinks this is deeply suspicious. And even though the woman didn't want to call the police, this man decides it is his duty to get the police involved. He takes the registration plate of this car, and that decision would prove absolutely pivotal. The car's registration led them to a man about whom the police knew nothing. The incident required him to give investigators into the assault incident a DNA sample. Our crime scene sample did then match against a new suspect sample, so that's a new person that's been loaded onto the database, they've been arrested, they've never been arrested before, first time their DNA has been taken. That sample went onto the database, hit against our crime scene sample, so much excitement at that point. And that suspect sample came through in the name of Shahid Al Ahmed. Shahid Al Ahmed was a UK citizen who lived at Bletchley, about eight miles south of Milton Keynes. Shahid Al Ahmed was a restaurant worker, a chef. Um, he was of Asian descent and apparently a quiet family man. He was married and he had five children. And that is almost all we know about Shahid Al Ahmed. He was arrested on suspicion of Rachel Manning's murder in September 2010. When it first happened, I heard it on the radio that Shahidil had been arrested and I think he crashed my car. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a good day that was. When his case came to trial, the court heard how Ahmed had picked Rachel up on the night she went missing on the pretense of being a taxi driver. Sometime in the early hours, he'd assaulted her before dragging her to Woburn Golf Course, where he'd strangled her before battering her about the head with the steering lock. The court heard how two specific pieces of forensic evidence proved Ahmed's association with the crime. A strand of his hair found in Rachel's clothes and the DNA found on the steering lock. So we've got the crook lock and did find DNA on the end of it that was used to strike the victim. On the other end, we looked for and found some DNA that we would assume was from somebody who'd gripped it when they were using it as a weapon. So we've got DNA from the victim on one end, DNA from what we hoped was the suspect on the other end. Ahmed received a life sentence for the murder of Rachel. After so many years, I never thought anyone would get found for it. I never thought in a million years anyone would get found for it. But after he got found guilty, it all came out that he'd done a few horrible things to people. But if they'd have phoned the police, instead of dealing with their self, if they'd have phoned the police, then I'd have been, I'd have been released a lot sooner because his DNA would have flashed up and it'd been the same DNA as on Rachel. But because no one reported it, he never got arrested for anything. It must have been huge for Barry and Keith because although they were actually out of prison at this point, I don't think it was exactly the same as, you've been acquitted, you're clearly... I'd like to think that we would have had a future together. I'd like to think we'd still be together to this day. Our uh, future was taken away in the most horrible circumstances that you could get. I mean, he battered her face in after she was dead and why would you do something like that? Why would you hurt someone, that, especially someone that, that nice and that caring? And she didn't deserve that. She did not deserve that. But if something positive has emerged from the investigation, it is the power of forensic science. This killer had left a trace on the murder weapon. And it was a trace that at the time would not lead to 
his identification, but years later, with the advances of DNA technology, that trace would finally bring justice to the family of Rachel Manning and exonerate forever Barry White and Keith Hyatt, the two men who had been wrongly convicted of Rachel's murder. Thank you for watching. Murder UK is a website dedicated to giving the facts about murders and serial killers within the UK. Please consider subscribing and press that bell icon to be notified when we update new videos. Thank you.